don't think you can see. I can't actually see the question on the blooming board, which is a bit of a bummer. Yep, okay. Right, question one. Say, say hello. 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 Is that not on the... No. Uh, I think the order of the slides has gone a bit weird. But you're number one anyway, so say the one that's on the board. What is your business? This is Luana. Hello. Good morning. So we're, um, so we, yeah, we're, uh, we're a company, we've got 50% we've got ownership each. Okay, so within the company we've got, we've got 25 shares each. And we've actually got 50 shares that we've left for the, for the future. So if we need to issue any shares or sell any parts of the company, we can do. But as we stand now, it's a 50-50% ownership. Uh, why, why do you think we did that? Huh? Yeah, but what, why did we do? So when you, when you start a business, if there's just one of you, obviously you own the whole lot of us. With, with us, there was two of us. Instead of us just having 50 shares and 50 shares each, we actually took 25 each. The other 50 aren't allocated to anybody. That means that the only ones that are owned, so I own 25, Chris owns 25, but nobody owns the rest of them. So at the moment we own 50% of the business each, but we've got 50 shares that we've not allocated yet. What might we use those shares for in the future? Gives you a little bit of ring room if you if you need to raise capital, then uh, you can do later on. Yeah, it could be that we took on an extra employee, and we wanted to reward them by giving them shares in the business. It could be that we take and took on a sponsor, and part of their agreement could have been they'll they'll give us a load of money in exchange for you know ten shares. It could be that we want to issue those shares to ourselves for to friends and family, or sell those shares for cash to other people. So it just gives us scope when we move forward. Um, yeah, if we'd have issued ourselves 50% or 50 shares each, then we've got no, no shares left, as 100% of the shares have already gone, we don't have those options left in the future. So. That's interesting. I mean, how, who told you to do that? You know, how did you know to do that? We did that at the beginning because there was, we had some other options when we started up mm. and we initially thought we were going to have to take on an extra person. We were, we were approached by a national nutrition brand that wanted to have a percentage of the business. Mm. So, but we didn't really want to do that at the beginning, yeah. but we, it kind of made us think about it. It's the sort of thing, if you sit down, when you set up a company, if you sit down with your accountant, your accountant will go through and explain all the options. Mm. So you just you have to look at the best option for you and what you want to do in the future. Like Andy said, it's not looking at sort of a year down the line, it's five, ten years down the line. Um, and it's, it's best to keep it flexible rather than you know, have something you can't mm. change. It doesn't mean that we own any less of the business. It just means that we've got scope to, you know, to bring someone else in in the future. Okay, thank you. Who's got this question, please? Sorry if it's numbered a bit wrong. What is your liability? What is a liability? Uh, company do not own. When, if you're liable for something, then what's that mean? Yeah, you're responsible for it. Brilliant. So That's Phoebe. Well, well done, done, Phoebe. Well done, Phoebe. So sometimes in business, if you break down what those words actually mean, then you can start figuring out stuff yourself. So, so a liability is, is a responsibility, which means that if you make money, then you're responsible for making that money and get rewarded. But if you lose money, then you're also responsible for that loss of money as well. So in business, you can do various things to protect yourself. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be personally liable for that business. So quickly. Yeah, so we're, we're actually limited liability, so we're only limited to what's within the company, okay, rather than uh, unlimited liability, which would be if our personal assets, our houses, mortgages, or other things are tied into to what we're doing. So if we, if we go out next year, we go out of business, we run out of money, okay, at this stage, 
the only things we lose is what's within the company. Okay, we don't start losing our houses and our cars and our everything outside of that. So it's the better way to be. Obviously, you know, you never know the future. Um, and you really don't want to put your whole personal life on the on the line as well. The advantage of putting your personal life on the line is if you want to raise capital and you want to raise more money, then you've got to put more things on the line for the bank to, to lend to you. So me and Andy said, sat down and said to ourselves, well, if we, you know, we wanted to, to go and buy something else, you know, then we could put our houses up as, as security for, that, for those loans. But it's a, it's a very dangerous and risky strategy um, for really for a, in a quite good position, keeping it, keeping it uh, limited. Especially the other thing you've got to do is look at the nature of, the, of, of what you do. And we've been really fortunate that, that we produced a, a fairly strong product and it's grown in numbers each year. But there's a lot of the event that was out of our control, um, for example the weather. Um, and we have to have use of the forest to be able to run the new forest. Now at any given time the new forest could have a problem, they could have a forest fire. They could have an infection in the forest, they could have an issue with wildlife. Um, now last year to this year, we used to pay a fee of £160, which isn't much, to be able to go out and use the forest. Um, that this year they've decided they want £10,000 for the same thing. So, so there is, when you look at the business, then you can see, well actually that we rely on external stakeholders, which we'll talk about a little bit later, for part of the business, then you've got to think, that's a little bit more risky than if we were running, a, you know, a cake shop or something where you've got a lot of stuff inside. So um, the nature of the business is that we definitely needed it to be to protect that, that liability. So. What's the actual thing you have to do to say, right? I want to be a limited company. Who do you? Is it with a solicitor? Yeah, an accountant and a solicitor. An accountant and a solicitor that you say, right? This is we have paperwork to fill out. It's the formation of the company. Yeah. And then you've got the structure. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you go in and you, you'll speak to a solicitor that specialises in setting up companies, if you go in and you have a meeting, you fill in a whole load of different forms, and then you get registered with a company number. And so, yeah, so really all the advice comes from that side. You, you know, even if you don't know what you're setting <coughs> up, you, you, you'll get the advice, and it's only around, it's about £200, I think, that was, to go and set that up, get the advice, and then get on the way. So. Okay. Uh, who's got that next question, please? Good morning. Come on in, Aidan. Come and have a seat. Who's got this question, please? Introduce yourself and then ask the question. Who's got this one? I'm videoing. Who's got this question? Has anybody? Question three. Who's three? Who is number three, anyway? I put number three on somebody's. I know it might not be in the right box. That's amazing. Danny, ask number. Th ask this question, please. That's Danny. Morning, Danny. What is the purpose of your business? Thank you. So the purpose of our business is a, there's a couple of purposes really. So we obviously all businesses need to make financial sense. That's the whole point of business. You need to make money um, to be able to put on the event, to be able to grow the event, um, and to to pay everybody within the business. So making money is a, is a big part of it, but we also, we've got other aims and objectives for the business, um, which are on our website. So after this session, if you want to go to the website and see the aims and objectives of what we do. Which really, website, the Aura Events uh, one, or New, New Forest, Forest Marathon, Marathon yeah. yeah. So one of our uh, objectives was to, to improve everyone's fitness across the forest, inspire people to be active, that was a major driver, both me and Andy come from a sports background, so we're quite active people and we enjoy getting out and being active. So it's not just about making money, it's about making people's lives better. Other businesses within um, you know, within the setup, making their business better, so it's growing, you know, spreading the spreading the good across the forest. Yeah, if you if you go out with a, a mindset that you just want to make money, then you're you're gonna crash and burn fairly quickly. Because unless you meet a need or you provide a service that the public want, then it's not going to be successful. So your aims within a business and the purpose of the business should always be to provide something somebody needs and therefore they're going to pay for it. Um, 
and then your secondary, kind of the outcome of that will be you'll make money for it because there'll be a demand. So, um, yeah. Um, our our um, purpose of the business has changed quite a lot. Whereas when we started the business, there was a massive problem with obesity, and that seemed to be in the headlines. In the New Forest, there was a huge issue with obesity, lots of inactive people. And we saw a big opportunity to get more people from all sorts of ages and, and abilities active in, in the national park. And it, there was an event there which existed that then stopped existing, and we took it over and revamped it to make it more modern. Now, the obesity kind of angle seems to have vanished out of the media. And now the hot topic is always sustainability in the environment. So our aims have changed quite dramatically. And if you go onto our website, we've now got a sustainability section, which explains how we're one of the leading events in the UK with regards to sustainability. So um, everything we do now is an eco angle, and the Rock to Rock, Let's Rock event is completely plastic free. So, um, yeah, so, so your aims and purpose can change. But it always has to meet a need. Yeah, the, the other angle with the new forest also is that we, we set up a charity. Historically, the whole event was run for charity. So we, we came in and changed it to half commercial, half charitable. So the other, I suppose, the other driver and the purpose is to actually raise money for that charity, and that charity then puts money back into the community and then drives activity. So there's three sort of angles really. It's a, it's a, it's a, a revenue as a business, a charitable angle. And then, like Andy said, some of the issues, the obesity, the sustainability issues as well. Okay, thank you. Who's what got this one? Are you what, what sectors are there? Go on. Yep. You, you tell us what sector we're in. What, is, what, what are they? What is a primary sector? That's all. We haven't done much on this yet. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Very good. That's Courtney. I didn't, I didn't know what you What did you say, Courtney? Raw materials. Yeah, cool. Second. What's next? Go on, Dev. You just said it, didn't you? Take a guess if you've got oh. no guns. Can only be wrong or wrong. What's it called, Dave? Is it? Oh, I don't know yet. Go on, Jake. Do you want to just say? What uh, secondary sector, you manufacture yeah. materials. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So you got you got your raw material. You turn it into something. That's, that's a, an easy way to put it. Isn't it? And then what's the what's the third one? And so we'll be brave here. Yeah. Um, tertiary. Tertiary, brilliant. Yeah. And what is that? What's that mean? So you sell the good or service to the customer. Cool. Brilliant. So which, what do you think we're in? Tertiary. Why? Because uh, you're selling uh, marathon back as a service to the community. Yeah. In order to make profit. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, you don't. Yeah. There you go. There's your answer. Well done, Jake. So well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got this one, please? Introduce yourself. Go on. Who's got this one? I'm not too sure what you mean by saying. Ah. Um, Lolly. Just introduce yourself. Say the question. Come have a seat, Ed. Right, do you know what that means? Have we covered scope yet? Um, can anybody explain what scope is? Go on, Courtney. Is this activities? Sort of. <coughs> Ernest? Um, national yeah. So are you local, are you national, or are you international? Okay, so we, we started off locally, obviously New Forest. Um, we took over the, the New Forest Marathon been run for 31 years in quite a localised way and then me and Andy came in and rebranded it, relocated it, reshaped it. Um, at which point it gained a bit of national attention, a lot of national press, ITV, BBC, some of the big running magazines 
So we're on a national stage, and obviously as we got onto that national stage, we then started to attract international um, customers, runners from Australia, America, um, where else in Bangladesh, we've had some from Africa. So all across the world, we've had runners from all over the world coming in. Um, whether we're actually well known in those countries is maybe slightly different, but we're definitely a national national business now. I think when you the difference with our business is is the England is obviously a well visited place from everywhere throughout the world. Within England, there's a few iconic destinations: London, Cornwall, the New Forest is up there with those. So if you are a runner, the likelihood is you've heard of the New Forest Marathon. Um, because the New Forest is such a visited place, and you guys probably don't realise this, you live so close to people will travel literally from Australia to New Zealand to visit the New Forest because they don't have anything like it. There's nowhere where you can walk around free roaming ponies where the forest, which is a workable landscape, and if you look into all the history of it, it's fascinating how the forest works. That kind of ecosystem only exists in England in the New Forest. And then we run 5,000 runners through the middle of it. So if you want to come and run and do an event which is totally unique, you, you're not going to get it anywhere else. And so um, that's why it's turned so many heads, because it's such a unique product. Um, and yeah, we've attracted people like Cunard, p and Garmin, ExxonMobil, um, National Press, let's say BBC, ITV. Um, and then, um, yeah, a lot of our runners will plan their holidays because they want to come and visit all these iconic destinations. And they'll say, right, I'm going to plan a holiday to the UK. We're going to do the New Forest Marathon and see the New Forest. Then we're going to go up to London. Then we might go up to Scotland or whatever. And so they build it into their itinerary. So it's become a kind of internationally known event. Um, the last three years, we've been named in the top five running events in the UK. So London, Brighton, the Great Run Series and us. So, um, yeah, the thing that's made us different probably our um, escalation from local to, to national sort of um, exposure really has been our, you know, put a, put a wider thing on. It's not just a run, it's a festival, it's seven bands on the stage, it's, it's camping, which Amory comes and helps us out with. So we have a big campsite, we have 70 food and drink traders and technical traders, so it's a whole it's a whole festival, I think a mini Glastonbury meets running in the forest. That's basically what we do. So it's very different. Cool. What's the size of our organisation? Who's, who's got that question? I don't think anybody's got that. I think my photocopying went a bit awry this morning. This is a really interesting one because the actual paid full-time members of staff in the organisation, so me and Chris, that's it. Um, we're really fortunate to have a wide skill set as we came into the into the business. Between me and Chris had a, bit of what, yeah, a huge kind of variety of different skills you could bring to be able to do to, to run the business. Um, so, well, yeah, I was going to say, what, what skills do you think we need to run the business with just two of us? I think that comes on later with the functional areas. Yeah, so yeah, that. hold that thought. Um, so size is just you two? Just us two, but we have about 600 volunteers. Last night, till about 11 o'clock last night, we were in a meeting in Fairham with the Army, with Raynet, which are amateur radio comms, because we build communication towers all over the forest to allow us to have communications. We had active search and rescue, which do all sorts of stuff with us. We have our, our road traffic. Um, road closure guys there. Um, we had an independent company which were in there overviewing everything we were doing. Um, so we bring in these specialist kind of people where we need to bring it in. We have a total of about 600 volunteers which come and help us with the event as well. So even though there's just us two full time, we have a kind of network of people that we go and speak to to allow our skill set to, to broaden. Yeah, so they're classified as a micro business, less than nine. Yeah. Okay. So the reasons for your success. Which goes back to what we said at the beginning, is that we 
we designed a product that was needed. And it was all about what we were really fortunate was we, we came in with a big skill set and a blank piece of paper. And we made the decision that there has to be a reason for everything we do. It's very easy if you go into another organisation, so if I came and worked in this college now, there'd probably be a whole load of policies and things that happen just because of tradition. Because it's been going for years and years and years and years, and there might not be a real definite need to do all of those things. And a lot of the things you just do because you think you've just got to do them. And there's not a rationale or reason behind it. We came in and we said from every single sign, to every pen, to every bit of paper, to every table, to, you know, to every banner we put up, there has to be a reason for putting it there. Otherwise, we're just creating work. So we've created a, an event where everything has an impact. And I think before all of that, we recognised that the New Forest had a massive need for this event. It was a recognised location, had a problem with obesity, and there was nothing like it that was happening. Um, and then obviously we've, we've delivered and it's grown and then we've been able to expand from there. So that's... Um, so you add, add, add into that sort of drive and passion, I mean, these words are banded around a lot, but when you actually, you've got to get down and, and do it. Like Andy said, we're, we're in fair and last night until 11, we go home at midnight, you know, we're up, up this morning back into this, which is, which is great. But on, a, on event day, we're, or event, event week, we have 10 days, it's 24 7, it's just bang, bang, bang. You've got all of this thing, all of these things hitting you. So, you know, unless you're really passionate and you've got that drive and you've got that want to succeed, then, you know, that's. Uh, in year happen. one, in year one, we, we put all we had on the table to get the event going. We literally, I was down to my last four pounds in my bank account, okay, because that's the way, that is what you had to do. And there was about a month where there was only four hours of the day where we both slept at the same time. So we changed our clocks so that we, we were up working from like four in the morning through, then we have a bit of a sleep, Chris would be carrying on, we'd be just, we'd, and we did that for a month because of the sheer amount of work and effort that you had to do to get it put in. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into business stuff. Um, so at the end of the day, that doesn't happen in every business. But we knew we had thousands of people and all the press walking through the door on a deadline, and it's a bit like your assignments, when you know there's a deadline, you've got to put that extra, but you might have to go a bit later or whatever to get the work done. Um, we knew there was that deadline, but it was our reputations and the reputation of the new forest and all the people that gave us a, the go-ahead to be able to do it that we didn't want to let down. So. I think part of the, another reason for your success is that actually people, you said they wanted the event, yeah. um, but you generate a lot of income for local businesses in the area as well. So, for example, in round Brockenhurst and Lindhurst, the people going out for meals, there are people staying at the campsites, yeah. um, and it generates, did you say about £2 million yeah. pounds yeah. worth of income for that local area? So, local businesses like it, local hotels and things like that, they really love it. It brings um, the spotlight on the new forest. Yeah, it's also um, the end of the tourist season, so they get an yeah. objection. It's um, September, yeah. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that we, with any business, you're only as good as the staff that you employ. And we're really fortunate to have lots of people like Anne-Marie that have got brilliant skill sets that we can put in charge of areas. So we've got probably 60, about 60 volunteers that are really good. And we put those in charge of registration, camping, you know, the, the race village. And, that's, and so... And, and these are people that have got massive experience working in really, you know, good jobs that, that have just got the right culture. And for me, that's probably the most important ingredient is the culture that you create in any business. So you're a happy business. And my old, the old job I used to do I used to manage about 40 staff and I, I oversaw 20 some, 20 organisations so there would be about know, 150 staff that came together for that. And it was if you had happy staff, you produce results. And that's, that's all that really mattered for me, was making the lives of staff happy. And, that's, and then you get, if you've got good staff, you get results. But we don't get to do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but a couple of times a year we get this brilliant team that comes together. And that's what creates the success. And actually, because of the way these guys are, with their volunteers, 
um, the volunteers keep wanting to come back and do it and, and wanted to come back and help. So these guys do treat us to a lovely meal and we have a really good fun night and they appreciate what we do in the time that we give up. So that is part and parcel of it, yeah. yeah definitely. I mean, it's easier to start, you know, when me and Andy started it, we said that was a key thing we wanted to get in place. It's easy to get the right culture from the beginning rather than change culture. If anyone's tried to change culture or look to culture in, a, in an organisation, it's very difficult once it's going down the wrong direction. So, uh, I think we'll look to yeah, thank you. Yeah, who are your internal uh, stakeholders? Really it's um, you two. So it doesn't say small, yeah. there's only two of us. Um, yeah, you're each so other. Andy's yeah. mine and Neil on his. Yeah. That's the, we tend to have different responsibilities within the business. We're, again, we're yeah, we're coming on that there. So basically, it's the internal stakeholders for these guys, just you two. So but you, small, yeah. 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 The next one is, is huge. <laughs> external stakeholders. There's about 70 businesses. Um, now, what, what is a stakeholder? I think what I was talking about in general, they are, yeah. Um, someone who might be in business. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, for us, being having such a big footprint in the community, then we affect so many businesses because we shut roads, we run through a national park, um, and it's that, very well covered. So, everything from the I'll press. Just get it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just on that one yeah. of those pages. Um, through our, we can't run the event if we don't have sponsors because the event costs thousands and thousands to run. So, without the help of sponsors, then we can afford to do it. Um, then we have stakeholders that give us equipment. So they they give us vehicles, they give us machinery to build stuff. We get tents brought in, barriers brought in, toilets brought in. Um, then we have the organisations within the forest, the New Forest District Council, the Hampshire Highways that shut all the roads, the, the verderers that work within the forest, um, different organisations and different businesses within the forest. Um, so we've got a slide coming up that will... Oh, did you send it to my mobile? Uh, I think you did. Oh, did you? I think so. Um, you could just go on the website. It's a number of stakeholders. Ah, it's absolutely it huge. You think of the, the land, who owns the, the land that we run through. So it's okay. not just one oh, person who owns the old forest. There's lots of different sections. You need permissions from all of those different landowners. Um, some of them need so rents, etc. So every piece of land you go past, you go past oh, other businesses. We affect the businesses. So they interact with the event. So, oh, yeah, 26 miles of running, running an event, you affect a lot of people. So that's. We'll we give you a list, a full list of logos on here. There's probably more than that, to be fair, that's just a snapshot. Um, but this gives you an idea. Business, so we're probably quite unique in the number of stakeholders. If you're a, I don't know, if you're a shop down here, like a, a news agent or something, you're not going to have such a, mm -hmm. such a number, such a wide range of people you're affecting. Okay, you're only going to have your, your immediate it's environment. One moment, talk about yourselves for a moment. Yeah, that's a shirt. 
So this, um, what Amber is about to, sh to, sh to, to show here, when we approach external okay, stakeholders, when we approach external stakeholders, we produce a document. Um, this this particular one was for sponsors. You call this a pitch deck or a media pack. Um, interestingly, companies in London call it a pitch deck. People outside London tend to call it a media pack. Um, you just scroll down through it. Oh, I'm just going to do that. I'm oh. just going to make sure I can see it. In there. So what this does is this gives a really quick snapshot of the event um, about what we're doing. So building a healthy community and building an active pathway. Um, it gives a really quick two second kind of overview as it keeps scrolling down. Uh, more than just a marathon. So here you can see that it's the festival we talked about. Um, everything from celebrities to camping to massage to stages to kids' activities um, keeps going down. So you say all of these are, ex are external stakeholders, people yeah, that so get involved in that. when we approach them, this is what we this to, to give them a, a quick snap overview of the whole event. Um, this just shows that the different ages and abilities we've got involved in the different kind of events that we have. Um, here's a couple of our external stakeholders, but recognised by the the running press keep going down. This gives you the demographics of the people that we that we attract. So 15,000 attendees. Our, our demographics in terms of our main age tends to be from about 20, 25 through to about 65, 52% male to 48% male. And in the UK, this is where they tend to come from. Um, you keep scrolling down, don't worry about the next page. This is about our charity. Um, and then the media coverage that we get throughout the UK. Keep, keep scrolling down the page of. This is what makes our brand unique, um, which I think we'll come back to later. Um, and then keep going down, keep going down. Keep going down. And these are our key current stakeholders. So just see if there's any, any logos there that you recognise. So obviously all of these stakeholders need servicing and they need talking to, there's meetings and you know, so you can see the enormity of the, of the project when you just look at just doing that, that alone running the whole event, um, all that brings. So. And do you rec recognise that logo? No? You will do next time you go to the supermarket. The Fife's so probably the biggest banana supplier in the UK. Um, they provide bananas to the runners as they come over the finish line. Everyone heard the Garmin? We heard the Garmin, yeah. So obviously they're a big uh, sports sports brand in, in running and, and timing. Uh, about this one. Are you allowed to say the one that you've been talking to or not? Yeah, we can. Yeah. It's not on there, is it? Which one? No, Tesla. Tesla. Oh, Tesla, yeah. They're, they're, so Tesla are... We hope coming on board, we haven't signed the deal with them yet, we're still in talks, but that's taken, we started talking to them about four months ago, so it's, does it, does it takes know a long time. Are? Yeah. So again, that lines up with our sustainability, um, which again is on our website, so we're trying to change as many vehicles as we can do to electric vehicles, to try and lower our carbon footprint, and our emissions throughout the event. So, but the other thing is just to send that really strong message back to everybody looking at the event, but, you know, that these things exist. Um, so, just to clarify, these are people that you've got a, um, Relationship. like relationships with. Yeah. Um, they're not the only stakeholders. Your list of stakeholders is massive because you've got yeah. New Forest uh, Council, you know, District, council. yeah. District yeah. Councils, yeah. Hampshire. Parish Councils, you've got Verderers, Commoners, yeah, the list goes on. This yeah, is just a snapshot of probably the headlines. And if you go onto the website, there's a partners section, and if you scroll down there, then most of the partners and stakeholders are on there. Yeah. And at the back of we produce a magazine each year, and at the back of the magazine, 
there's a big list of, of, of our, our thank yous and acknowledgements to all of those stakeholders. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So not many internal stakeholders, but a no, huge amount of external. Yeah, we make up yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Let's go on to the next one. Yeah, so uh, has somebody got this question, please? Yep, okay. So you, how, yeah, how do your stakeholders influence your business? You tell us. Give them an example of somebody, how could they influence, yeah. So, so one of those logos, guys, think of one of those logos. How do you think they work with us or influence what we do? Who can give an example? Garmin, for instance, what, what do you think Garmin do, or how, how they influence us, or what do they do? Provide yes. equipment, okay. So what else is Garmin trying to do as a business? What's the purpose of Garmin, do you think? So Garmin are located probably about 10 miles from here, so they're all sat in a big office, but what are they trying to do? So Point at somebody. So watches, yeah. So what are they trying to do? Um, we we think with our, our event. Uh, I don't know, advertise American? Right. Well, they advertise their watches, isn't it? Yeah. So they're basically trying to get exposure for their products, their watches, through our event. We've got lots of people. We've got 15,000 people. So they're trying to sell watches, aren't they? So we estimate that they they sell about twenty to thirty thousand pounds worth of watches through our event every year. So, so for them being a stakeholder, them being a sponsor, a partner, it's quite a good deal for them. Yeah, because they can put some money into a sponsorship, but in return they can sell twenty to thirty thousand pounds worth of watches. So it's a good good calculation isn't it, for them. So that's just one little example of you know Garmin and, and their. Um, their influence on us. Yeah. Um, I saw an interesting one, and they wanted like to promote health, have a healthy being. So yeah. they want to show people to be active and not um, like counteract obesity and stuff. Yeah, but they brought out a program a few years ago uh, called the Couch to 5K program. It was backed by the NHS, um, and it was all about people getting from the couch doing nothing to running their first 5K. So we did a lot of work with them in, in the in the beginning stages of the marathon, trying to get as many people active. We have a walk, a 5k, a 10k, a half marathon, a full marathon, so there's a proper pathway there to activity. So the NHS came on board and helped us with resources that we've put on our website to make our website a little bit more credible, because um, we didn't want to just put stuff on there without it having a credible name. So that's, yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, so every, every one of those stakeholders has got their agenda and they're trying to come to us with their agenda, so we've got to accommodate all of their, you know, their, their desires and their aims and build that into our event uh, to keep them all happy. Yeah, so they, they influence us quite a bit. Now the, the, the question, how do your uh, stakeholders influence your business success? Well that can be good and bad, and we said at the beginning that the, the Forestry Commission, they're under pressure, they're a government organisation, they've had their funding cut, so now they're trying to charge us lots of money to be able to use the forest. So it makes our job a lot harder. So they can influence our success the other way as well, by making the job a lot more, more difficult, um, by saying no to things, by not supporting us. And we have to respect that and try and come up with ways around that, which is, is quite a challenge sometimes. Um, equally, we had a sponsor last year that has had to make probably half of their workforce redundant and then they pulled out with us because they said they can't support the event knowing that they've had to make all of their staff have done them. Um, so we then lost about eight or nine thousand pounds. Well that's quite a big chunk to lose, um, which means that we then have to either make cuts or we have to find that money somewhere else. So every one of those stakeholders, if they, if they affect you financially, it's going to have a direct effect. If they affect you through stuff they give you, for example our stage supplier or barrier supplier, something like that, then you're going to have a logistical impact. So 
there is no point having a stakeholder unless you have a relationship with them and you provide them something or they provide you something. So, and, and that's going to obviously have two ways. So, yeah, that's it's key. Another thing is your volunteers. They're, they're stakeholders. They have a, uh, and if they're, they're brilliant volunteers, they're all really positive, it has a positive effect on yeah. the event, mm -hmm. means people want to come back. However, if you get somebody that's not acting um, particularly nicely, it can affect um, the event as well in a yeah. negative way. And also someone like ExxonMobil, if, if you think of them, they could have a negative effect on our success. Why, why might they have a negative effect? Exxon Mobil do. do you know what Exxon Mo Mobil do? Do you know? No? Who knows what they do? So what sort of company are they? What do they, what do they sell? Aidan, do you know? Okay. What do they dig out of the ground? Mm. Oil. oil, yeah. So big oil company, mm. normally seen as a bad boy, aren't they? The big oil company ruining the planet especially in this sort of environmental sensitive If you look across the Atlantic water, you see that massive, that massive power plant. If you haven't looked across there, we've gone across the Isle of Wight. On the right-hand side, as you go out to the Atlantic water, it's a massive power plant that provides all the electricity for the whole area. But they also provide a lot of pollution for the whole area um, and a lot of byproducts and fuel. So for us, they're a major employer of the area. They're a huge name, they're very, very rich, but at the same time, they have a big impact on the environment. Um, now, they're working through their agenda, and a couple of years ago, we had to make a decision, do we stay with them or not, because we knew the plastics thing was going to be a big, big issue. Um, but actually, we've gone and we've actually got a meeting with them this afternoon, um, and that top of that agenda is what have they done between last year and this year to improve their carbon footprint and they're going to use us to be able to communicate that to the community. Mm. So that that then means that we can basically ask them for more money because we're bridging that gap for them. We had a we had uh, we actually dropped a sponsor last year um, that that we decided we didn't want involved with the new forest marathon which was Ineos. Mm. You know what Ineos do? They basically produce plastic. Um, they were a very small sponsor and they just helped us with our kids race and they supplied t-shirts for the run and all sorts of bits and bobs for our junior race but we thought for the impact that they give us it wasn't worth having the having the connection to any of us so as our yeah we, we didn't want to be associated with them at, at that, that time they produce so, all the little tiny little beads that go in face washes so when you scrub your face, those plastic beads, tiny, microscopic, were going plastic. down the drain. I, remember, I just remember yeah. them being one of the ones that produced that. Pretty much everything yeah. plastic comes from a plastic source, which is the cheapest way of making plastic is these little beads that gets then melted down into chairs, table, whatever. Pretty much everything you see that's plastic has come from, from Ineos. Well, the idea is that that then gets put into a circular economy where you recycle that plastic and then that creates more pl more plastic stuff. And plastic, if it's used in the right way, is fantastic. Like if you use plastic in t-shirts, they'll probably last 15, 20 years. If you use plastic in water bottles, that water bottle will last years and years and years. And that's how we want to use plastic for chairs because they're not going to wear out. So plastic is a brilliant material if it's used in the right way. If it's used in the wrong way and only used once and then chucked away, then it's actually very expensive to reuse that plastic again. And so, until INEOS get that right and um, they have more recycled plastic going in and being changed than they're producing more plastic, then we've decided to step away mm. for the moment. Yeah, so it's always a trade-off between what they can give us and give the event and actually the PR behind it. So Exxon, <coughs> Exxon Mobil at the moment they give us um, quite a bit of sponsorship, so it's worth taking that sponsorship maybe for the slightly shady PR behind it if they can get that side of things right. So but that's a constant, constant mm. decision we've got to make. Um, and then this question here, what written documents do you have to produce for which stakeholders are they affected for? Well, every single um, stakeholder will have a separate relationship with. So William Shipping, they provide a lot of the 
the staging, the containers, the storage for us on site, and that we're in negotiation with at the moment. Um, but that will, but that will become a one-page document, which will be a partnership um, contract between us. Uh, that could be a three-year contract. It could be a one-year contract. We haven't finished the negotiations. And then something like the Forestry Commission is very, very different because they have to produce a thing called an HRA, which is a habitat something. What was that? Habitat and what's that? RA. Right. RA. Right. Uh, I can't remember now. But it basically it assesses the impact on the, on the habitat. Um, that's a very, very different document because it looks at the, our carbon footprint, looks at the impact on the wildlife and in terms of the new forest. So that, that, that is obviously completely different. So, but it's very important for us that there is a concrete paper, paper trail between each of those external providers. Who was that with? The HRA? HRA. Yes, and with every one of these partners, you've either got a, an agreement, a contract, uh, a right of use, you know, there's, there's, there's written documents all and the way through that. And if you think of everything we've talked about so far, and the fact that there is only me and Chris in the business, then you start realising how busy you are. You have to run, run one or two events. And all of this gets repeated for Rock to Rock. We've just been talking about the new forest at the moment, but Rock to Rock Let's Rock has exactly the same. We have traders coming in, like every, everything from somebody selling burgers. Some, okay, so somebody selling burgers, I'll give you an idea of the uh, paper trail for that. It, you have an application pack, so we get all of their details, what, what local authority they're linked with, their numbers, their phone numbers, all of that kind of details. We have a health and safety policy, we have a risk assessment, they all have to sign up to. And then we ask for a number of paperwork, a food, health and safety, like a uh, health and safety risk assessment from them, a hygiene certificate, a hygiene rating from them, a certificate to prove that their equipment they're using has been proved to deemed to be safe. What else do we have done? Public liability insurance, fire records. So that's just from one trader. And we have about 80 traders on site and about 30, maybe 20, 30 for Rock to Rock. So um, that's just on that little bit there, if they're going to come on site. And then we've obviously got our, all of our own internal documents and our own internal. So yesterday we were producing an event plan for, with the, with the fire service, they sent us a document um, down in Cornwall that they want us to build into our event plan for Rock to Rock. Well, that took us pretty much the whole day to, um, to implement that fire safety plan into our event plan. So there's a paper trail with everybody. And there's another stakeholder, the fire services. Um, there's, a, there's an organisation called the SAG group, the Safety Advisory Group. So if you're going to put anything on which is going to affect the local area, it has to go through the Safety Advisory Group. They will look at every aspect of your event and make sure it's safe and then advise you if it's not safe. Um, so they pull together the police, the fire brigade, um, the ambulances, the road traffic kind of closure people, and a few other stakeholders from the, the local community, like local councillors, and they sit down and they hammer you for about two hours. And they say, what are you going to do if there's a fire? What are you going to do if there's an incident here? What have you got this here? Yeah, and you, you have to be able to produce it. But they, they again, the stakeholders, their document is a file that's that thick because you can't miss a beat. Because you work on the principle that if there was an accident, could it have been avoided? And that's why our meeting went on so late last night, because um, I work on the water a lot, do a lot of stuff on the water, and every now and again there's an accident at sea, and if you go to court, first thing they say is, what did you take, what measures did you take to avoid it? And that's exactly what we do with our business too. And if there was a way of avoiding an incident that we haven't done, then we're up the swanning. Um, but that has to all be documented in a file. So, um, it's amazing when you see these events, a lot of people will just think about the event. When we think of our business, 99% of it's in an office. And then we just, when you actually get to put the show on, it's really it's nice because it's just like, oh, yeah. you get all this stuff out that you've been planning for ages. Okay. So. Next one. So, somebody who asked that one. Oh, I've pretty much just told no, you. No, just, yeah, just go yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah, so all presentations, so that, that can range from anything like today, coming to, to meet you guys, to going into sponsors, making a presentation about why they should sponsor us. That's quite a 
Got another key one. We do stuff with local councils, making presentations of you know, road closure orders and, and public uh, public meetings. Obviously, getting the, the residents on board, the businesses on board. Because unless we present to them, you know, what we want, um, they're not going to fully understand and necessarily be supportive of it. So most of those are, are things like this up in front of the. Uh, Meetings and, and PowerPoint um, presentations. I don't know if you guys can see that. That was a that was a photo from our meeting last night. That was another. Wait, oral presentations are everything because people, like, as you guys know, it's easier to watch something on YouTube than it is to read it. And so if you can talk to someone, it's a lot easier and it takes a lot less time. And then at the event but, we do obviously all those different groups need. Uh, briefings, so we have volunteer briefings, we have car park briefings, we have registration briefings. So again, a briefing is, is the easiest way to get all the information across, educate or train the people uh, what you want to do to be able to um, set the plan in motion. On that point, now I realise and appreciate that it's a long time for you to be sitting and listening. However, how many lessons do you think it would have taken me to have taught you all the things that these guys are actually making you visualise now. So this, this talk is really important. Um, yeah. One yeah. thing that like, we see when we, we try and take on work experience every year from a university, um, one thing we see is that lack of ability to, for, for all that, that student to talk to people. It's such a key skill. And the biggest thing is, is, is the skill to be able to talk on the phone. And the number of times we have to say to people, an email doesn't do a job. But if you need to get hold of someone and you need a, a direct answer, you can send an email as a paper trail to, to confirm the conversation after you've had it. Okay, but sometimes you just need to talk to people. And having that confidence to pick up the phone to talk directly to someone is a big way. I, I used to work in education. Um, I sent an email across the other day to Ofsted. Um, so I'm going to do some work with Ofsted and didn't get the response I wanted. 99% of people would have stopped there or written back. Picked the phone up. I spoke to the person that was in charge. I had a 45 minute conversation and now it's the relationship's way, way better. So it's, it's key. That's, that's that ability to talk in front of people and talk on the phone will make you different to other people. And that's what you know, we see it time and time again. And it is about practice with that. Yeah. Just yeah, having definitely. a go. Yeah. Um, I think we've just gone on to that a little bit. So, why is communication important? Yeah, I mean, this so, is, yeah. and and a little bit about social media, if you could. So, social media for us, I mean, that was key to key to our success right at the beginning because social media is the easiest way to communicate to, to everyone. And what, what's the other advantage of social media as a business? What's it going to do? Um, you can advertise. Absolutely. So it's one of the biggest benefits in the last 10, 15 years for a business to, to get involved with. It's free marketing, free advertising. Everybody within that network, that social media network, is actually doing the marketing for you. Back in the day, 20, 30 years ago, you had to rely on a poster, you had to rely on a newspaper advert. Okay, these are the only ways to communicate what you're trying to do and get people turning up for a ticket. Okay. Now, just by by creating a good social media community across three platforms, you know, that basically starts to take care of itself. And it's free. So like Andy said, when we first started, we didn't have, we didn't have much capital. It wasn't as though we had 50,000 in the bank and we could start spending money left, right and centre. So you've got to do it organically and grow it the best way you can. So that's what we did. But really good social media campaigns together, good, good channels, making it actually social so it's not too corporate and get people interacting and then you build up the trust and then you can, uh, you can sell your product. So, so for us, I think social media is one of the, the key things that, that helped us uh, communicate. What about your website? website Why is, is that important? Website helps, obviously social media, we tend to then point people to the website. So the website gives all the information that we need to get out. So that's the way we use it. It goes social media to the website and get people signed up through there. So we can put more detail on the website than we can in social media. So we, the other thing, all of our volunteers, we've got 600 volunteers, 
for Rock to Rock, because that was down in Cornwall, um, we did all of our stuff via, via PDFs that we embedded on a hidden part of a website and then sent those links out to all of our staff. So all of the staff knew what they were doing before they got there. So there's just an example of one of the packs that went out of all of the briefing, all of the rules in case of a fire, where everything was going to be laid out in the venue. So this year we're going to be doing a lot more of that but via video so we can send all of that out to all of our volunteers. Um, Communication is key because it, there's two of us that, if you think of it like that, two of us come up with an idea, we then have to make that idea happen, but we can't, you know, there's 15,000 people, we can't be the mouths of every one of the staff that are dealing with every one of those 15,000 people. So we have to produce enough clear communications to the next layer down, and understand it, and then pass it on to the next layer down, and the next layer down. And time and time again, we're told that volunteers have told the wrong information to the public. So one of our challenges is to make sure that that's it's crystal clear. And the bigger you get, the harder it is to make sure that that, that kind of clear communication, communication comes down. But um, yeah, if, if you've got a volunteer that says to somebody to go the wrong way on a on a route when they're running a marathon, yes, yeah. that would be a disaster. Yeah. We also have um, yeah. WhatsApp groups. We use WhatsApp a lot. Um, so our volunteers for the marathon, so for us that's, that, that goes two ways, um, so again the Rock to Rock event, we have a Rock to Rock that's Rock race crew group, has got about 30 people in it, they all come and volunteer for everything we need to say to them in terms of everything from weather forecasts to where certain things are to whether the event's open or not, we put on that WhatsApp group so everybody gets it at the same time. Um, and it works for us as well because one of our sponsors, we're sponsored by Ford down there, and they provide provide jeeps for us for on the beach. Um, and at the end of the event, they said to us, "Have you got any pictures of us of the jeeps on the beach?" And we we taken some, our photographer had taken some, but we put a message out to that WhatsApp group and said, "Did anybody get any pictures of the jeeps?" We must have had twenty odd pictures back from our staff. So it works both ways. So we get to see. See other things going on. So WhatsApp's very, very powerful, um, especially for videos as well. So yeah, it's never been easier to actually communicate. That, so. <laughs> I, I uh, made that up. Is that still the case or not? Yeah, if you on the mag on the website. Yeah. Um, if you go on the website. By the way, you put the mm. <laughs> but, um, Does the everyone way, know what an organisational um, channel is? is? Under the you could, uh, oh, that's you could give us a definition of an organisation which are the same. Yeah. Um, so, like, layers of higher on the image, so people have different roles in the business, and it shows who's like higher, and has more like responsibility, and mm -hmm. it takes care of the other person for that part. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so it's a sort of like, it's a chart where you can get an idea of the business, really good explanation that, an idea of the business and who's who and what they do and their roles. So you get a snapshot straight away. So ours is very small. If you think of somebody like Garmin, then that's an absolutely huge chart. Um, yeah. so you can have lots of different sections, sales and marketing, finance, the chief executive, etc. right at the top. Okay, and come all the way down to the guys oh, on the factory floor and security and everything else. So oh, you know, ours is very simple. There, yeah. There's a, on this year's magazine, it's not on the website. Did you take it down? Well, I couldn't find it unless it's hidden somewhere. Yeah, let's try and look. Yeah. So basically, our organisational chart goes me and Chris at the top. We split our responsibilities. So anything financial will go through Chris. Anything graphic, media-wise, tends to go through me. And then we anything logistics to do with the event tends to go through me. Um, Hang on, that's the one so, of the next ones. That's the functional areas. Oh, so wait there. So I just wanted to get, just move out of the way a little bit. I just want to get the. That's Jackie, and Ian. Is oh no, Ian's not still there, is he? No, he's. But Evan's not on there, is he? But Evan is here. No, this is this was a yeah. Years ago. So this year's one's a little bit more obvious. All right. It's probably easier to understand your chart. Yeah. Just the four yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so like we're saying, ours is a really simple 
organisation chart, like we said, there's only me and Andy in the, in the business. Um, these are they act more as subcontractors. So does anyone know what a subcontractor is? Anyone want to guess what a subcontractor is? Has anyone heard of the word subcontractor? Sometimes you hear it within building. So basically it's people or companies that you, you bring in at a certain point. So we don't actually, these guys aren't actually part of our, our company. Okay, but we bring them in at certain points throughout the year when we need them. Okay, it's a bit more financially viable to do that rather than rather than uh, pay Jackie for 12 months a year. We just bring her in for what we need to, her to do. So she looks after the magazine, she looks after some emails and some social media when we go onto site and we do other things. So um, so that's what we do with, with Jackie. Oh. Jackie's gone. Yeah, and the same with Evan. So you can see our organisational chart is basically made up of, of just four. Okay, we've got this, me and Andy, and then dropping down to Evan oh. and Jackie. Oh, there's a in that. So, I didn't mean to do that. So, so this is basically known as a flat structure. There are advantages of this flat structure because commu communication is really quick and easy. Um, we're going to come on to the jobs that they do, um, which will give you a bit of an indication of the disadvantages of not having different functional areas. So we'll go on to that next. But you can probably tell from the chat so far that we, we spread ourselves fairly thinly because our skill set has to be like that, which means it's very hard to become a real specialist. Um, so like I took before, I look after all of the graphics and any, anything that we need to get created in terms of artwork, I tend to do, but I'm not a graphic designer. So um, like I designed this year's medals and t-shirts um, that, that you know, the runners get um, about two months ago but I couldn't get them into a format which we have a company in, in China that creates the medals but I couldn't get it into a format that a company in China would use again so it would be able to use to reproduce the medals so then that's when we have to outsource so that's one of the disadvantages of having only two of us, we can do most of the job, but sometimes we have to pull in extra people to say that I can do this, but I can't do this well enough for it to be used for, you know, six, seven thousand medals. So, um, yeah, but, so uh, yeah, I was going to say, you know, in, our, in our operation, we, we tend to be more general, like Andy was saying, we're, we're general managers of all the areas, okay? In a bigger organisation like Garmin, they're going to have specialist accountants, specialist marketing people, Special and technical people, an um, IT, and yeah, IT, and, and it goes on and on and on. So, um, yeah, we we've just got to be a uh, we've got many hats on. There's lots of things we you know what we've tended to do is we found that there's year one there was obviously loads and loads of jobs that came in and we just had to take responsibility for those jobs. So it depended how busy we were as to which jobs we took on. Um, so traders is an area that I deal with. It's a real pain in the ass because there's so much paperwork that we talked about earlier on. Um, so we'll tend to, anything that comes in via a trader tends to come to me. I'll deal with all of that side of things. And then we know the job's done. Um, if Chris starts dipping into that, then we don't know which what we've done. And it all gets a very confusing picture. So we have a folder, an email folder, anything that comes in via that goes straight into my Andy trader folder. And then I can deal with that systematically. So the key to having a successful organisation is making sure that the cogs actually work. So we have so many job cogs, there has to be a clear structure within that company so that we don't pop things up. Um, so anything financial, I won't even touch it. I'll just say that's a Chris thing, that's a Chris thing. So, it's a, so I know that Chris has got total control over that area and I'm not going to go in there and muddle the, the, muddle the water at all. So, um, yeah, and, and, and I suppose in between there's, there's some crossovers so with Andy's traders, you know, when he's doing his trader stuff, and I'll dip in with the financial element of his trader stuff and other little bits, and vice versa the other way. So it's not it's not total control, but again, you've got to work together. Um, somebody's got to take the onus on, on that certain area. Yesterday when we were writing the fire safety plans all out, that was something we needed to do together because we take responsibility for different parts of the event. So it, that was... We needed to have a, a better global view of the event to be able to do that properly. So, 
Um, yeah, there isn't a really, there isn't a right answer to that one. It's kind of a, we basically have to do everything. Just how we do it is making sure that the communication between me and Chris is really clear. So we use a lot of lists. Uh, we've one of our walls in our office. We've covered in a, in a what's called, I think it's called magic paper or something. So it's like basically it's a complete white wall, and we can write all over the wall, so we know what's going on. We we take areas of responsibilities. Sometimes we do that via uh, via social kind of via our phones, and we just ping it across to each other or whatever else. So. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that's on the website. Okay. You just go to the about. I think it's on the home page, home page. I think, yeah. Oh. Oh, there it is. So we spoke about this a little bit earlier about our aims, you know, within the business, right. obviously, was to make... You go back to the home. What? Uh, you were on it a minute ago. There you go. Yeah, so obviously one of the aims of the business was to, to make money, but we, we started off with these six, it's just off the page, but six um, six aims of what, what we aim to do. So when we first started to revitalise and raise the profile of the marathon at that stage in 2014, the marathon wasn't running, it runs for 30 years, and then like I said, me and Andy came in, we rebranded it, relocated it. So that was one of our first things, to get it back up off the ground and, and growing for the future. And the second one was to inspire as many people as possible to try and get them active. Andy spoke about the obesity problem, um, us wanting to, to get that activity, linking in with the Couch to 5K uh, campaign and that sort of thing, to try and lower that level of obesity and improve the health of everyone. So that was our second day. Uh, we wanted to build a, a sustainable platform um, to, to raise money. So that was the charitable side of things. When we took over, like we said, historically it had been run as a charity. So we wanted to keep that ethos going forward um, and make sure that that was something that we carried through, uh, even though we're going commercial with the main part of the event. So that was our third one. And moving on now, fourth one, uh, to use the marathon to, to help as many people as possible. So you could see we're helping local businesses, tourism, uh, residents, community groups, there's so many people that affects um, and helps. So it's not just us being successful, but we spread that success across the across the forest. And then number five, we wanted to operate with transparency, uh, high moral standards. So that's really key to get the trust of anyone from the volunteers to, to whoever you're dealing with. Um, if you don't take the moral high ground and do things right and proper, then you won't gain the, gain the respect. So that's quite a key one for us. And then we actually changed this on, it's not been updated. We had a, there's a line in there about sustainability that we added to the media plan. And yeah. it wasn't like that. But um, we need to change that. that and then finally, was just to support the national park. Um, yes, that's where we, we, we live on the other side of the national park, but it's something. That's where me and Andy were born, we we're close to our hearts and it's just a nice place to think that we can you know, make it a better place and for, for more people to enjoy. So we come up with those four, uh, sorry, those six, um, those six aims right at the beginning. So before we even thought about making money and everything else, that's, you know, that's, that was our driver really. And the good thing now is to be able to look back at that and look what we've done over the last five years and to be able to turn around and say to people, look, We've done that, we've done that, we've done that. It's quite nice because it shows that you're not actually out there to make money, you're out there to make a difference. So. Yeah, and a lot of people have a goal, they set a goal, and it's nice to be able to look back and say, right, we've, we've, we've achieved those goals, tick, tick, tick. Just to be able to differentiate, when somebody writes a goal or their aim, then they would have objectives underneath each one of those to say how they, the steps that they could 
monitor to, to, to uh, know whether they're actually achieving their aims or not. So um, you probably make lists of how you're going to do those different things. Ah, so we are coming on to that. Yeah, so the top one to, to revitalise and raise the profile of the marathon, I mean, that's, you know, subsections of that, that's huge, isn't it? Yeah, that's just the headline, that's what we want to do. But how, how are we going to do that? That is, that's lists and lists and lists of, of steps to, to make that happen. We, we create documents, um, big to do lists, which basically map exactly what we have to do right the way through to the event. So, at different stages of the year, we have different documents that kind of come into play. Um, so, right now, it's all the kind of formations, the partnership works, so and that kind of stuff. Um, but then, as it gets closer and closer to the event, then it's very, very specific about, you know, by this point on this day, this needs to be happening. And so, as you get closer and closer to a deadline, it's more and more important that the smart targets are accurate. So, for example, you might know that there's 120 toilets that are going to be turning up at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. Okay, if they don't turn up, then you know you've got to do something about it because you've got 15,000 people about to turn up and it has to be sorted out. If that's you know a month or two before the event, it probably wouldn't, the smarter part of it would probably be more about making sure that the toilets are booked, the double checked, and the invoice has been paid. If so, and they, they've been sent across, we have a toilet drop plan so that when they come on, on, on site, they know exactly where to drop the toilets. Um, and then we have a setup plan and then a checklist to make sure that, that they come and they're all set up properly. So they, yeah, just the journey for the toilets, they tend to be fairly loose targets and if they even know about the toilets, they make sure that the infrastructure is there to be able to put them in place and then on the actual event kind of week they're very specific and very time related so um, but day to day we definitely um, so we'll sit there like yesterday we had a whole load of jobs that we needed to make sure were done before we had the meeting last night so they we have our targets in the morning um, we tend to at the end of every day we sit down and we set ourselves targets for the next working day so um, on Tuesday we had a day where we weren't working together in the office, so we set ourselves targets on Monday evening for what we were both going to be doing on Tuesday, even though we weren't going to see each other. Um, so mine was by the end of the day to have put in the infrastructure for the fire safety plan and to have got my head around all the legislation that we need to be able to understand to be able to build the document the next day. I can't remember what my other time was on Tuesday. I had two things. Uh, I had to. Trader. Oh, yeah, I used the trader application pack for Rock to Rock, which was making sure that all the traders, their application pack was accurate, ready to go out to a number of traders that Chris had promised he'd get the documentation to. So they were the two things I had to complete by the end of the day on, on Tuesday. Chris had his own targets as well. And then when we meet up on, on Wednesday, we can go, right, this is what I've done, this is what I've done, are we ready? Yeah, that's all good. Then it can work. Yeah, so it's not always setting it out with smart smart targets so operationally so when we're doing it day to day all this is going on in our heads and we know what we need to do we need to be super specific with it it needs to be measurable etc etc but we don't necessarily write it all down as smart on a piece of paper there's just not enough time in the day to be able to do that so it's more of a more of something you, you do in your, in your head and you, you adhere to that sort of model if you can. You'll, you'll yeah. do it naturally. Yeah. After a while, it's got to be specific. I've always got to get the job done. It's got to be measurable because I'm going to be sitting down with Chris the next day. And it's not fair if I've done a load of work in the end and vice versa. So you're going to have it done because you're going to have to see it the next day. It's got to be achievable. And I'm, if I said to Chris, you know what, that's just too much work. I'm not going to get that done in the day. Then it will change it. Um, Realistic, obviously, in time bound, we've done by the end of the day, but we don't sit there and go, right, let's get up to smart targets and make sure we set ourselves our smart. We just we just set ourselves a target to do the next day. So, um. Um, is there any, are there any questions you can answer, such as when uh, the old New Forest Marathon, as it was, it used to be raising money for yeah. charity? Yeah. Do you know, did you set a target to say, right, we want to raise this much money? No. No. No, because you, you didn't we, know. Because again, you, you don't know the unknown, you can't promise what yeah. you don't know. So, I mean, our target at the beginning was just to set the charity up, get it functioning, get it funding all of those groups, so we didn't <coughs> we didn't let them down. Yeah. In the latter end of 
the previous organisation, they let all of those groups down, and that's why they failed because they didn't they didn't actually get funded. We knew that so within the first two years we wanted to have at least five grand in there because the aim was by year three to be an independent charity. Right. And you can't become an independent charity. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's a smart so, yeah, so that is yeah. yeah, that is a smart target, isn't it? Yeah. So now, okay. you know, in the last five years, we've we've raised seventy five thousand pounds. For those community groups on the charity alone, yeah. so you know, so they've done awesome. quite well over, yeah. over five years from nothing to, to 75 grand. So, it's and that's cool. through people running for that charity and doing the event, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're sponsored by ABP, the ports there in Southampton, for a couple of years, which gave us a boost. Um, but that's come to an end now. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got people, people running, so we give out places. So, we say to somebody that do you want to run our marathon? We'll give you a free place if you raise a hundred pounds for our charity. So as a, as a company, we we gift places. We get all the, all the runners, everyone signing up. We give them an option to to add a couple of pounds to their their entry fee. So it's just a nice thing to do. Unless we get these community groups, the whole event wouldn't run. So for somebody to to give a couple of quid when they enter, um, just to be able to make the event run, then that helps as well. That's another source of source of revenue. Yeah. Um, we sell. T-shirts uh, for the for the community groups as well. So if we've got any leftover T-shirts from last year, we'll sell them in the following year. That creates a bit of money. And then we also do our junior event. Our junior event is fully uh, funded, um, so everyone everyone pays to enter the junior event. But all that money goes to the community fund. So so as a business, we're giving back a little bit, um, and so are the riders. So the key, the other thing with smart targets is, is I'm a big sticker for making sure that you actually have a life as well. Like it's really I'm a big surfer and surfer, and it, for me, like Tuesday the surf is fun to Tuesday. So I'm I'm like that. Give me the targets that we're going to do for the end of the day, and we'll work whatever to make sure they're done. It just means that you can enjoy your time off as well. Because that's so key. It's, just, it's, it's like you guys going like, you know, I'm going to smash all my workout in the morning by ten, and then I'm going to go for footy or whatever. It just means that you subconsciously can relax. Otherwise, you know that you're going to be out there, and you've got you're going to let the business down. At the end of the day, that business is what pays for your food, and you're always going to else. So that the business has to come first because at the end of the day, it pays all the bills. But with the targets, it, they do allow freedom as well. So and that's part of the thing. We work hard, but you've got to have a life at the same time. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really key. Like we're down in Cornwall next week, setting up the, um, setting up the Rock to Rock event for this year. And for sure, yeah, we'll, we'll get a few serves and more there. But we're all, we've got our agenda, that we've got our meeting schedules already planned out for next week. We've got everything all set up. We know what we've got to achieve. But, but equally, we'll, we're getting the water at the same time. It's, it's part of running a business. You've got to do that. And for me, the whole life and blood of the business comes from your free time. Yeah, and for, we spend a lot of time solving problems, and that's you know that that is you know if you can't solve a problem, don't run a business because ninety percent of what you do will be figuring out how to do stuff. But for me, that comes from the free headspace. So if I know I'm quite dangerous, if I've had a good surf then it gets pretty productive in the office. And if I haven't been in the water for a little while, it becomes a bit stale, it becomes a bit rubbish. So I think it's, it's really key when any of you guys ever run businesses or, or whatever, you've got to build in that time for you to have your time so that, you know... It's, yeah, it's, a, bit, it's a big motivational thing, really, you know. It's not, not necessarily stood here trying to... We're not motivated necessarily by money. It's, it's trying to... It's that balance between money and lifestyle. So. If Andy goes out and surfs, then he's motivated to crack on in the office, and, and vice versa. If I if I want to do something, I'm motivated to get that done, and, and then go out and enjoy yourself. But yeah. Okay, that is it. Thank you for your patience and your listening. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions while they're here? Feel free to do that. Have a shuffle about. Thank you, guys. Sorry. Right. Anyone running this year?